A lot of times we can get overwhelmed with life. Um, is anybody old enough? I'm sure you you are. Uh, but do you ever remember seeing a commercial where the lady would scream or, or holler and say, Cal, gone, take me away? Yeah. <laughs> you know, sometimes life can, you know, pile on you and, and you feel like that uh, you just need some help. And I'm glad David begins here in verse 1 by saying, Bow down thine ear, O Lord, and hear me. For I'm poor and needy, and I thank God for the new covenant because many times under the old covenant they were kind of speaking out of faith, and we get more of a complete picture from the new covenant, and I'm glad that we read about how that the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and how that he's not a God afar off, and it's not like we have to get you know his attention. He sees us. He knows us. Um I know sometimes I've seen little kids would, you know, maybe misbehave or do something a little unique because they wanted attention. And so David is saying, hey, bow down thine ear, O Lord. Hear me, for I am poor and I'm needy. Preserve my soul, for I am holy. O thou, my God, save thy servant that trusteth in thee. And, uh, you know, he's trying to list his... uh, his resume of why he's worthy of this. And and again, sometimes, you know, um, people in life will try to maybe listen to the wrong voice and, and, you know, try to justify to God of how worthy they are for God to move. But God will move because he loves us, not because we're worthy of it. As I've often said, if we got what we'd have deserved, we'd have been cut off when we'd all went to hell because the Bible says the wages of sin is what? Death. And so, uh, you know, David, like a lot of folks, is trying to list his, you know, qualifications as far as getting God to move. And um, verse 3, he said, Be merciful unto me, O Lord, for I cry unto thee daily. And I think it's a good reminder of how that we need to learn to be consistent when we are praying for a move of God or praying for God to help, that we don't pray for just a short amount of time and then give up. But in realistic terms, have you ever prayed about something and got discouraged and the devil tried to say ain't no use? Yeah. Well, David, he said, he said, I heard you the first time. Uh, uh, Daniel. Daniel. Okay. Yeah. And if you remember going back into Psalm 31, he made a very relative statement that I go back to a lot. Uh, Psalm 31, verse 22, David said, For I said in my haste, How many times do we get in a hurry and we thank God, you know, you need to move yesterday. And uh, one of the great examples of this, I think, is John 11. Remember how Mary and Martha said, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And how many times do we uh, do the same thing? Lord, if you'd have just moved, I wouldn't have had to went through that. But how many believe the Bible? Well, the Bible says, and it's a hard thing to get a hold of. Now, when it suits us, we can get a hold of it. But sometimes when it doesn't suit us, we need to be reminded of it. The Bible said in Romans 8, verse 28, For we know how many things? All things work together for what? For good to them that love God and who are they called according to his purpose. So even though I may not like it, it may not feel good, if I believe the Bible, then I have to believe that somehow, some way, God is going to get something good out of it. And, I, you know, I guess it's kind of relating back when we were children. You know, uh, sometimes we get something set in front of us and we think, ooh, that looks icky. But it was for our benefit. And uh, as you get older, you begin to see the benefits of those things that you went through. And a lot of times when we go through a problem, we can't see the benefit of it, but then as you get on the other side of it and look back, you can um, see that God's hand was right there. It is. And have you ever noticed that, though? Have you ever come out of something and look back and said, well, that really wasn't good at the moment, but it really helped me or I learned from it. And so uh, he said, I cry unto thee daily. He said, rejoice the soul of thy servant, for unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Now, verse 5 is one that I have underlined and highlighted because um, have you ever met somebody that kind of went along the lines of saying, well, maybe God's getting tired of me or maybe God don't want to forgive me? You ever met someone like that? Listen to what David said. He said, for thou, O Lord, are good and ready to forgive. God is ready to forgive if we're ready to ask. 
But a lot of times I hear people make statements like, well, but you don't know what I've done. Well, God knows what you've done, and he's still ready. It's not his will that any should perish, but that all should come under repentance. And so he makes this wonderful statement, and, and I've shared this so much, and that's why I have it highlighted and underlined. He said, For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all, notice that, all them that call upon thee. And so we have not because we ask not. And uh, God is ready, and he's got plenty of mercy. Uh, you know, I, I've met some people in my life that used to kind of annoy me in a big way that they would make that mistake, and then they would say, well, maybe God's getting tired of me. I say, no, God's not getting tired, but if you're you know, using that as an excuse to keep falling into the same thing, you need deliverance. You know, it's one thing to make a mistake, but to continually fall back into that same thing there's a problem there. But he said in verse 6, Give ear, O Lord, unto my prayer, and attend unto the voice of my supplication. And uh, verse 6 here brings to mind something from uh, 1 John. And let's flip over to 1 John. 1st Epistle of John, not John 1, but 1st Epistle of John. And I want to show you something. Um, faith is, is so important, but faith is more than just saying the prayer. But faith is getting to that place that you know that God's hearing you. Even though he hadn't answered yet, but uh, that he's listening. First John chapter 5, amen. Uh, I'm going to begin in verse 4 and go down to verse 14. Um, it's skipping around a few verses, but I do recommend you read this for your own benefit. It will strengthen you. Listen to what he said in verse 4. He said, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Not just someone else, but it has to be a personal thing. But listen to what he said going down in the verse 14, and here's why it's relative. And this is the confidence that we have anything, uh, that, that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Verse 15, and if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. But see, many times in, I don't know about your life or prayer life, but um, have you ever had the devil try to make you doubt that God was even listening? You ever feel like God was maybe a million miles away? I mean, there are those times you feel God, and then there are those times that it's by faith that you're praying and the devil's going, he ain't listening. You know that thing you did. You know that thing that you thought. You know that mess up that you messed up. And the reason why he does that is he wants us not to pray because he knows that if we pray, there's power in prayer. The Bible said the effectual forever prayer of a righteous man availeth what? Much. Much. And so uh, we need to pray and we need to cry unto him daily. Amen. He said, Give ear, O Lord, unto my prayer, and attend to the voice of my supplication. In the day of my trouble, I will call upon thee, for thou wilt answer me. But see, under the new covenant, we also learn that it's not just in the day of trouble. We need to have that consistent relationship, that we don't just come to God whenever we're in need. I've known people in life that whenever they come up and start complimenting you, you kind of get suspicious, and you go, What do you want? <laughs> You ever know anybody like that? I mean, they never had time for you. They never really had a good word to say. But then it's like, hey, you're looking pretty good. What? How you been? I mean, wow. Hallelujah. Glory to God. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, we need to have some consistency, not just in the day of trouble. It's like I, I was talking one time. Uh, I remember, you know, having an old car one time that I was driving. It was a work car and had a flat and went for the spare, and the spare was flat. And uh, that's why he warns us in Proverbs chapter 1 that he said, because I've stretched out my hand and no man regarded, therefore I laugh and mock when your calamity comes. In other words, it's a dangerous thing to take God for granted, isn't it? And I think one of the primary uh, examples of this, there are a lot of people that think when they see him coming that they're going to be able to cry out for mercy in that instance, but... I don't know about you, you ever have a close call in driving? It's over quickly. I mean, you ain't got time to say, Lord, have mercy. It's done over with. 
And so that's why the Bible tells us that we're to seek him in the accepted time, in the time that he may be found. Any questions or comments before we go on? Amen. Now, verse 8, you may have some questions on. Um, he said, Among the gods there is none like an unto thee, O Lord, neither are there any works like an unto thy works. Now, if you'll notice, the gods that he mentioned is little g. And there are a lot of people who claim to be God. There are a lot of idols that are acknowledged as God, but they're not really God. They don't have the same authority or the same power. They're, they're not even in the same league, for there is no God like an under our God. And I like how David explained in one place, he said they have eyes, but they cannot see. And they have ears, but they cannot hear. And I remember a missionary friend of mine one time was talking after a big tornado had happened and knocked one of the big Buddha statues over, and they were crying for Buddha to get up, and he couldn't get up. But I'm glad our God is not in the grave. Our God is very much alive. Verse 9, he said, All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. For thou art great and dost wonderful, wondrous things. Thou art God alone. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. Now, verse 11 is one, again, that I really think has a lot of meat in it because there are a lot of people who read the word of God and they get kind of discouraged because they say, I don't understand it. But we need to pray for understanding. The Bible said, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask who? Let him ask God who giveth liberally unto all men and upbraideth not. And so if you ask God to teach you, God can show you. God can open up the truth. And he said these things are spiritually discerned. I mean, to the natural mind, it may not make sense. But the Bible says it's spiritually discerned. So teach me thy way, O Lord, and I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. Now, that fear is not a, you know, ooh, booger fear, but it's a fear of respect. Just like... Uh, you know, you're driving down the road and you see a state trooper over in the median, you slow down because you don't want to get ticket. So there has to be a, a, a respect there. He said, I will praise thee, O Lord, my God, with all my heart. I like that. He didn't go, hallelujah. He said, with all my heart, I'm going to put my heart into it. He said, I will glorify thy name forevermore. For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. Isn't that a good reminder that God's mercy is great toward us? Now, a lot of times we, we put other people on the shelf or up on a pedestal and we say, well, he ain't been where I've been. And maybe his life wasn't in the bigger mess as mine was. And so, you know, yeah, God will forgive him. But, you know, God's mercy is great even towards you. Because God is what? No respect to a person. And God doesn't have favorites as far as uh, picking one above the other. God loves us all. And it's not his will that any should perish. And a lot of people don't understand that. And not only that his mercy is great toward us, but he has delivered us from the lowest hell, from that deep place, that place of isolation. He said, O oh God, the proud are risen against me, and the assemblies of the violent men have sought after my soul and have not set thee before them. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering, and here he's making this statement again, and plenteous in mercy and in truth. Boy, I'm so thankful for the grace of God. Because, you know, have you ever stopped and thought about it like this, that God foreknew all things? And so if he foreknew everything, then he knew every time you'd mess up that you've messed up since you've been saved. And that didn't stop him from reaching out to save you the night that he saved you. Isn't that an awesome thing to think about? I think that it is. Because a lot of people have the attitude, man, if I knew then what I know now, I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have done this and I wouldn't have done that. But you know what? I'm glad God's not that way. I'm glad God is plenteous in mercy and truth toward us. He said, oh, turn unto me and have mercy upon me. Give thy strength unto thy servant, and save the son of thine handmaid. Show me a token for good, 
that they which hate me may see it and be ashamed, because thou, Lord, hast opened me and comforted me. Amen. I'm glad that God gives us tokens every day. David said it this way. He said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's with thee be blessed his holy name, and forget not what? All of his benefits. He daily loaded us with benefits. There are so many things that God does that if God didn't do it, you realize you lay down, go to sleep, take a nap. Anybody ever take a nap? I'm pretty sure most of us in here at this age probably all take a nap. <laughs> yeah. And the very fact that you woke up out of that safe and okay is the mercy of God. God kept you. You know, uh, I know a lot of times nowadays they have those CPAP machines and they say to keep you, you know, breathing, keep your heart and stuff. Well, before that, you know, it was God and it's still God that keeps us going. If it wasn't for God, we wouldn't be here. Any questions on Psalm 86? All right, Psalm 87, we'll get through it real quick. It's only just a few verses. The Bible said his foundation is in the holy mountains. The Lord loveth the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of thee, O city of God, Selah. Now I will make mention of Rahab and Babylon to them that know me. And behold, Philistia and Tyre and Ethiopia, this man was born there. And of Zion it should be said that this and that man was born in her, and the highest himself shall establish her. The Lord shall count when he rideth up the people that this man was born there, Selah, as well as the singers as play on instruments shall be there, and all my springs are there. And it's just talking about Zion and how that God loved Zion. There was something about Zion that God loved. And I do know there are a lot of ministers who have done great in-depth studies upon that and how that even the mountains are shaped like the Hebrew letters for the name of God. And, uh, and you know, I believe from what I read in the scripture that, you know, the world started in that, that section of the world. But in everything that God does, God has a plan. And I'm glad that God has uh, engrafted us or adopted us that we are citizens of another country. We're here. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. And one day we're going to move to our forever home, and that's to be with him. Any questions on Psalm 87 before we go on? All right, Psalm 88. Amen. I love how he starts out. He said, O Lord God of my salvation, I have cried day and night before thee. He's identifying who he is. Lord, you're the one that saved me. And I've been crying day and night before. Have you ever had a season like that where you're waiting on God to move? <laughs> Amen. Well, the Bible said, let us not grow weary and well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Why? Because to everything there's a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. He said, let my prayer come before thee, incline thine ear unto my cry. And just as... Uh, Brother Winford was talking about Daniel, you know, uh, in the beginning of Daniel 10, when he prayed, even though he's prayed three full weeks, it's not to the end of the story that we see the conclusion of it and that God heard him the first day. And you know what I get out of that is that sometimes we may not see the answer right now, but we will one day. Walk by faith and not by sight. Yes. I mean, sometimes it, you know, it takes it takes time for that faith, you know, that he wants you to uh, trust in him. It's like a learning experience. Ain't it? It's like a, a fellow told me one time. He said, "I ain't trying to be funny, but he said you ever cheat and open your eyes when you're praying, okay. watching everybody else." You know, seeing what God's doing in their life. He said, "You know, everybody's praying and they're humble, and then it's like." That curiosity comes and you're peeking around trying to see what God's doing. Well, you know, sometimes it's easy for us if we see God moving in someone else's life. But again, we have to be careful that we don't allow that to influence us. Because even when we don't see, even when we don't feel, 
His word is forever settled in heaven. Right. And we got to stand by what his word said, not by what we feel. Now, if I'd have went by what I felt like, I'd have, I'd have, I wouldn't be here tonight. But it's what we believe that matters. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why I really dislike Halloween so much. And I know there's such an argument on both sides. Uh, people say, well, you know, the devil didn't make that day and all that, you know. And they say, well, this is harmless. But anything that, to me, that tries to put a spirit of fear on you, I think is not a good thing. For the Bible said that God has not given unto us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. And and I think that we have allowed so many things to affect us over the years and really rob us of the power of prayer. The church was known as the house of prayer, and it was supposed to be a praying church. And just like in Acts 12, where they prayed for Peter to get released, and he got released, or Paul and Silas worshipped, and they prayed, and, and God opened every door, and everyone's bands fell off. I think that's one of the old paths that we must get back to, and that's a place of prayer. But let me ask you this, and, and be honest, and you don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to, but isn't there a time sometimes when you're praying that you're almost in the verge of getting carried away, and then the devil says you're taking up too much time, and you kind of cut it off? Well, that's, that's something we have to learn to really, really be careful of. He said, let my prayer come before thee, incline thine ear unto my cry. Kind of reminds me whenever I read that about incline thine ear. In other words, what was that? <laughs> I'm glad God ain't hard of hearing. We may be hard of hearing. Um, I remember one time a lady come to a church I was at, and her name was Dovey. And I guess I had my ears stopped up, and I thought they said Stubby, and I thought it was a, a nickname. And I'm like, well, praise the Lord, Sister Stubby. <laughs> And everybody's laughing at me, and I'm like, what? You know, and it's because I didn't hear right. But I'm glad God's not that way. God hears us. And God can hear us in our mind. You know, even if you're not praying out loud, God can still hear. He knows the great thoughts of God. That's right, and he understands our thoughts afar off. And so if God couldn't understand our thoughts afar off, you know, I'm glad we don't have to scream to get God's attention, you know. And, uh, oh, yeah. He said, for my soul is full of troubles, and my life draweth nigh unto the grave. And uh, kind of reminds me of how that sometimes people, you know, how are you, brother? I'm about dead. And yet the Bible said death and life's in the what? Power of the tongue. We need to be careful. But I know sometimes we feel bad, and we feel like that we're heading that way. But you know what? We ought to have the determination that I'm not leaving here until God says he's done with me. I've got a job to do, and I've got to do what God wants me to do. He said, I encounter with them that go down into the pit. I am a man that has no strength. Free among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, whom thou rememberest no more. Amen. And they are cut off from thine hand. Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit in the darkness with the depths. Now, what does it sound like to you? It sounds like he's kind of on a pity trip. You, you ever get on a pity trip? Yeah. I always called that the hee-haw spirit. I remember that whenever I was growing up, and they'd sing that old song, gloom, despair, and agony. On a lot of folks, that's that's kind of the summary of, you know, uh, whenever you meet them, how are you? Gloom, despair, and agony on me. We have to be careful, though. We need things to encourage us and to pick us up and not get around those people that uh, are going to discourage us. He said, Thy wrath lieth hard upon me, and thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves, Selah. But now, two, you got to know who the real enemy is in a situation, whether it's your flesh or whether it's the devil. A lot of times people blame the devil for everything, and sometimes it's the man in the mirror. Yeah. Yeah, Hello. <laughs> you know, somebody said, the devil did this and the devil did that. I remember one time, and I guess I was pretty mean of doing this, but uh, this lady, all she did was complain. I was in a revival uh somewhere and I went and bought a toy saddle for uh, a little horsey uh, that you would buy in the toy set and I give it to her she said what's this for I said this is to remind you to take the saddle off quit letting the devil ride you every day yeah. and uh, and I think that sometimes we do we need to remind that you know you 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 got to come out of that you got to do something 
He said, Thou hast put away mine acquaintances far from me. Thou hast made me an abomination unto them. I am shut up, and I cannot come forth. And again, he's kind of on this pity trip, and he's focusing on death and dying and negativity. And if David, being a man after God's own heart, can get that way, then don't, don't ever think that you're above that. Don't ever think that you can't get discouraged. You know, we have that testimony. How are you, brother? I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. Yeah, but sometimes we do have issues. All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And so we have issues. And, you know, a few years ago, the thing that was so popular was name it and claim it. And everybody was like, don't be negative. But sometimes you've got to address the problem before you can get it, you know, the help that you need. One thing I think about, we're, we're not home yet. Right. That's we're, we're, we're just like a fish out of water now, but we're saved. We're not home yet. Mm-hmm. Nobody. Because Abraham, that goes along with what Brandon and what's talking about Sunday. Brandon and how do you vote? Yeah. Have a right answer to show high up there yeah. that you can't fall, but you can. I'll well, see, that's why the Bible said that if any man think that he standeth, yeah. let him take heed lest he fall. And, uh, I mean, I remember years ago at the radio station, you get those young folks in there full of uh, zeal, you know, thing they're going to swing over hell on a rope with a squirt gun and attack the enemy. But you and I in self are no match for the enemy. That's why even Michael, when he disputed with Satan over the body of Moses, said, The Lord rebuke thee. Right. In other words, not my own strength. And if we ever get to the point that we think it's us, then we have deceived ourselves. I, I mean, I, I've heard him say that, you know, literally. And uh, Romans 12 for just a minute. I know we're jumping around a little more than we normally do. But Romans 12 kind of just come to my heart, so I think it's relevant. Uh, verse 3, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. And uh, it, it reminds me, you know, being younger, and a few years ago it was like we had icier snows. And have you ever walked on the ice and thought, I'm doing real good, and then had that one little mishap and it scared you to death, and you realize you're not as stable as you thought you were, and you're, you're trying not to fall? Well, life can be that way sometimes. Sometimes you can think, I got this worked out, I got this figured out, and then one little slip, and you're trying to find something to grasp a hold of to steady you again. I'm glad God can steady us. Any questions or comments? Amen. He said, Mine eye mourneth by reason of affliction. Lord, I have called daily upon thee, and I have stretched out my hands unto thee. Will thou show wonders to the dead, and shall the dead arise and praise thee? Now, you know, there's a good application there, thinking about that, that if we're dead spiritually, are we really going to see a move of God? Will God really show wonders to the dead? You know, so sometimes we need to stir ourselves up by way of remembrance and remember, you know, he put life in us. He said, Shall thy loving kindness be declared in the grave or thy faithfulness in destruction? Shall thy wonders be known in the dark and the righteous in the land of forgetfulness? But unto thee have I cried, O Lord, in the morning shall... My prayer, prevent thee. Lord, why casteth off thou my soul? Why hidest thou face from me? I am afflicted and ready to die from my youth up. While I suffer thy terrors, I am distracted. Thy fierce wrath goeth over me, and thy terrors have cut me off. They came round about me daily like water and compassed me about together. Lover and friend hast thou put far from me and mine acquaintance in the darkness." Which brings up an interesting point. Have you ever went through a time of what I call 
spiritual isolation where it just seemed like that you were there, but a lot of folks were maybe there too, but they wasn't with you, that you were kind of isolation. I think those times can be special times. It may seem like something that's scary, something that's fearful, but I think sometimes God wants us to get our attention focused back on him. I know a few years ago before all the technology used to be you had to get a timing done and sometimes your car would get out of time and you had to time it. You, a lot of you men know what I'm talking about. And sometimes even though we're kind of going through the motions, we can kind of get out of sync, out of whack. And, and, and God sometimes, I think, allows us to get into that place to where that the only distraction, the only thing that we have is Him. And once we get back where we need to be, then God can work again in our life. When somebody told me like a car, when it starts missing, pretty soon you know it's going to quit. Mm-hmm. Yep, that is true. And uh, why why does a car miss? You something wrong. Well, it's out of tune, but more specifically. <coughs> plug. And you know what? If the gap is not right... There can be no fire in that plug. And sometimes that little spark plug, if the gap gets off, in other words, if there's a distance there, there can be no fire in that plug. And likewise with us, we can be there. I mean, I've seen people there who were not there uh, mentally. I mean, they were there physically, but their mind was somewhere else. Sometimes you got an age children just running on the floor. Right. <laughs> or have you ever got on what I call remote control and you're sitting there talking to somebody and you're going yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah and then they pin you down and go, what was I just saying? <laughs> got no idea and you've been yeah and a lot of stuff and you got no idea what in the world you've been yeah and sometimes we get that way and I think like the psalmist is saying lover and friend that was put far from me and my acquaintance in the dark, sometimes people can be a distraction, did you realize that? People can be a distraction. And the Bible says we've got to work out whose salvation. And so sometimes people can't, because just like we go back to Psalm 73, just a little bit. What did the psalmist say in Psalm 73? He got a little envious at the wicked. Verse 3, for I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Sometimes people can be a distraction. And sometimes God has to move that distraction out of the way. I remember when we were in school, and I don't know what it's like now, but if you talk, sometimes they'd have to separate you. You know, you sit there and you, you come up here. <laughs> oh, yeah. And uh, because people can be a distraction. And sometimes you might be the innocent one, and they're going, hey. And then you turn around, you're the one who gets caught for turning around, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Teacher one time was teaching, and I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be. I was doing whatever. Anyway, she said, "If you two don't hush, I'm going to separate you." I said, "I didn't know we were married." <laughs> I never smarted off to that teacher again. She didn't say a word. But the look she gave me would show you love it. <laughs> and so it, it it can happen. And likewise, spiritually, you know, sometimes you can get focused. And I have known people who have come in confidence, you know, in counseling, and they say, look at them. I mean, they ain't even trying. And look like, man, they shout all over the place, and they just get so blessed, and here I am trying, and I can't get nowhere, you know. And sometimes God's got to put you in a corner or allow you to put yourself in a corner so he can get your focus back where it needs to be. Because one thing we learned from a match only takes a little spark to make a big fire. Yeah. Isn't it funny that the match head is so small and the body of the match is so big, but it's that little part that makes the, the difference? Yeah. All right, Psalm 89. I will sing of thy mercies. Of, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. Getting used to these bifocals. Having a... <coughs> He said, For I have said, Mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shall thou establish 
in the very heavens. Now, in these two verses, we already see an attitude change from the previous psalm, don't we? He's not negative. He's not down. He's talking about his mercy and about his faithfulness and how God has made a covenant. Verse 3, I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up the throne to all generations. Now, sometime when you get a chance and you want to really look at that, and I've had people ask, why David? Well, you should go and read Matthew chapter 1, the genealogies, and see where David come from, what happened before David came, and who's in his lineage. And the one thing that I always thought was so grand, and I thought about it when we spoke about women here, is I said mostly you read about men, but there's some women mentioned in the lineage of Christ that if you and I had wrote the Bible, we might have been uh, inspired by the times to leave them out because they were not what you would call perfect. I mean, we expect Mary to be there. I mean, you know, the mother of Jesus. But uh, you don't expect uh, Bathsheba, you know. You don't expect Rahab the harlot. Uh, and Tamar is a lady right out of a soap opera. Yeah. I mean, her life was so so uh, unique, I'll put it that way. I mean, she was married to a guy who was so evil, God killed him. Then she married his brother, and God slew him. And then while she's waiting for the young next son, because, you know, the, the old law was that if you didn't have any seed, the brother had to marry and raise up seed under his brother. While she's waiting, she ends up having an affair with her father-in-law. Yeah. yeah. And yet she's there. And, you know, and people will go, man, you don't know what I've done. I said, well, you apparently ain't read the Bible. There are a lot of messed up people that are there. And thank God for that. That gives us hope. We know that God is a merciful and a forgiving God. Especially because I know he, he has been through troubles and trials most of his life. Been, has been chased. He, he's been hid, you know, and I think the one side, though, that we leave off when we speak about David, and sometimes I've had people say, but you know, look what David did. Well, yeah, but look at all that he suffered because of it. Right. You know, that, that sin does have a consequence. And I had that talk, you know, recently with my daughter, and I said, you know, you know, God ain't the one that's behind a lot of these things that are happening. It's the results of bad choices. You know, the Bible said, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And it's like, I believe a man, if you commit murder, I believe that you can find legitimate forgiveness, but you're still going to have to deal with the consequences. Right. Yeah, there's still going to be consequences. And there are some things that we can, yes, be forgiven of, but there are going to be consequences. And so just because you're forgiven doesn't mean the consequences are going to disappear. Amen. All right. Well, yeah, and people have this attitude. They're like, well, I'm doing it. I ain't hurting nobody but myself. You know, but it is. You know, uh, there is an environment. And so we have to, you know, consider um, the greater picture. And there is, if you go back into the book of Judges, there is a unique story I've never really heard preached about too much. Um, do you remember how that there was the, the Levite and how his concubine got abused until she died and there was a war with Benjamin over it? Anybody remember that story? Not Well, anyway, when they gathered together to go up to punish Benjamin, they uh, prayed and they went up and they got defeated. And they asked God, do you want us to go back home or do you want us to go again? God said, go again. They got defeated again. And there's such a good example there that sometimes even though you have a righteous cause, you have to make sure that you pray and you be led by the Spirit of God. And even though you've lost or been knocked down, you got to get up, pull yourself together, and you got to keep going. And then they did win the battle in the long run, but it wasn't an instantaneous thing. Somehow David didn't have a battle like that, but he asked God, 
Second King, uh, Second Samuel chapter five, and he went over by the mulberry trees. He didn't go the same way as he did before, yeah. and how that sometimes you can't do what you've always done without having what you've always had. Sometimes it takes a little bit of a change, and uh, that's why we don't make things routine. Sometimes you can make routine and end up missing God. Well, we've always done it this way. Well, that's maybe why we're still having the same results as we've always had. Sometimes you got to do something a little different. Now, I don't like experimentation in some things. I know my son made some uh, macaroni helper there one day, and I thought, it's a little different. He put mustard in it, and I didn't like that. But uh, I'm like, experiment on someone else. Praise the Lord. You know, I like my cheesy. I don't like it with the, the wang to it. But anyway, praise the Lord. Uh, what what verse where did we leave off? I got sidetracked. Rabbit trail. Five. All right. Amen. And the heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness, also in the congregation of the saints. For who in the heavens can be compared unto the Lord? And who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of his saints and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. And I think that's so important. I think that's something else, again, that we're losing is the reverence. What do you think reverence means? Yeah, and, you know, now there's just like... We want you to be comfortable. Well, I don't really come to church to be comfortable. I come to worship. I didn't come to, you know, be comfortable. And now so many things, standards are going down and and people are just allowing every little thing coming and going. And uh, I don't know. I think we're losing the reverence. I mean, when you get the picture of Moses starting up towards the burning bush and God says, wait a minute, you're going to have to take your shoes off. You know, you're on holy ground. Hey, wait a minute. I think we have kind of somehow lost that in a lot of our churches. You know, if the people just do anything, you know, and... Uh, or preach anything or anything else. I, I never will forget a few years ago, especially, it used to be so bad, you know, you'd hear people doing their nails, you know, click, 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 <laughs> you know, and uh, it's kind of disrespectful and... I was in uh, Oklahoma one time in a revival and, uh, years ago, and I told my wife, I said, don't unpack. I went in, service started, and people were on their cell phones right in the service. I mean, rings going off, you know, doo 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 Speak up, they're having praise and worship. And I mean, not even going out of the sanctuary. And so uh, I told Sarah, I said, don't unpack. Let's see where this first one goes. And then the guy who was leading the singing was acting like he was Stevie Wonder. If anybody else got up to sing, it was just really disrespectful. And, uh, uh, it, it, you know, it's not the same everywhere you go, I'll put it that way. Amen. A lot of respect is, is gone. I think it's disrespectful when people speak when you're Well, I, I mean, and I, I've been places too when they go, hey, that's good, ain't it? I'm like, you know, not trying to be mean or rude. Sometimes I want to go, shh, or even more severe and say, shut up. I'm trying to listen. You know, this this is important. We're begotten by the word. And, and you know, and yet sometimes people, they just really disrespectful. It does. You know, if you're not in one accord, you know, it's hard for God to move. And that's one of the reasons why we don't see the manifestation of the Holy Ghost in a greater way. Um. But verse 8, he said, O Lord God of hosts, who is a strong Lord like unto thee, or who is, uh, or to thy faithfulness round about thee? And I love how that his attitude changes. He said, Thou rulest the raging of the sea, and when the waves thereof arise, thou stillest them. Thou hast broken Rahab in pieces, as one that is slain. Thou hast scattered thine enemies with thy strong arm. And... Uh, now, a lot of people, they try to put Rahab as some kind of monster, some kind of thing. And you know, that's something else I don't understand today. Man, they got a name for every devil out there. I mean, once you leave the confines of Scripture, I'm wondering, where does a lot of their information come from? I mean, if it's not in Bible. 
And, you know, and people, they talk about a python spirit. And I understand pythons squeeze you, but you've got to make sure that you don't allow stuff to be superimposed in the scripture that's not there. That's like I've told you before. This guy said, you know, what about the archangel Raphael? I said, Raphael. I said, the only Raphael I ever heard of when my kids were small, they watched Ninja Turtles and they was a Raphael. Yeah, well, but they say, well, that in the Apocrypha there's so much. I said, well, I won't read the Apocrypha. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't read those things. Amen. Verse eleven, he said, "The heavens are thine, the earth also is thine." So we need to be reminded of that. This earth belongs to God. He owns the cattle of a thousand hills. He said, "As for the world and the fullness thereof, thou hast founded them. The north and the south thou hast created them. Tabor and Hermon shall rejoice in thy name." Thou hast a mighty arm, strong is thine hand, and high is thy right hand. Now he's, he's bragging about how good God is and how that he's a strong God and how he has a, you know, a, a, a mighty arm. Our God is not a little bitty God. You know, I've had people say, oh, your faith is a crutch. I say, have you ever looked at the bottom of a crutch? I'm standing on something a lot bigger than that. A crutch is not nothing. And I've seen people fall under a crutch. But you know what David said when I said, thy, My foot slippeth, it was thy mercy, O Lord, that held me up. God is able to keep that which we commit unto him. So our faith is not a crutch. He said, Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. Blessed is that people that know the joyful sound. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. Now what do you think this joyful sound is? We just read through it and take it for granted. Hallelujah, go on. What do you think it is? That's something for you to look at for next week. What's the joyful sound? Well, you know, you have to go deeper, you know, deeper with that. There's, there's more. I mean, anybody can holler. And anybody, you know, I mean, they holler at the football game. There's something that makes it different. And there's something about the sound that he's talking about that's unlike any other sound. And so you just look and see what you find. I know that I don't really expect anybody to be able to pull it out from, you know, uh, out of your hat, so to speak, for right now. But uh, I think it's good to, to understand that the one thing that sets us apart, that makes us different, you know, there are a lot of religions but there's no religion like us because we don't have religion. We have relationship a God. and a living God. And our God is not dead. And there's something about the joy that sets us apart that's different. And, you know, it's not really a small answer. It, 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 it'll take like a little paragraph to really explain. That, that goes along with it, but... As Bugs Bunny used to say, you're getting warmer. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you look at it and see what you find. But I think it does us good to pay attention to these little nuggets because, you know, somebody said, well, you know, they were just, you know, really joyful. But I've seen folks that know how to do it, and there's a difference in somebody that knows how to do it than somebody that's doing it for real. Yes. You know. I've seen happy people, but then I've, I've seen people that God touched, and the difference was when God touches somebody, it's a different kind of joy than just everyday joy. It's like the whole thing. It's real. And it's nothing to, I mean, it's not, not something fake or anything like that. I mean, it's, it's real. And you don't have to act like it is anything because it is. Well, let's look at the next couple of verses and, and see the context to kind of go along with this. He said, In thy name shall they rejoice all the day. And in thy righteousness shall they be exalted. For thou art the glory of their strength, and thy favor 
our horn shall be exalted. For the Lord is our defense. Hallelujah. That's the good stuff right there. The Lord is our defense. And the Holy One of Israel is our king. Then thou that spaketh in vision to the Holy One and saith, I have laid help upon one that is mighty, and I have exalted one chosen out of thy people. And I have found David my, ser uh, my servant. With my holy oil have I anointed him. With whom my hand shall be established, my arm also shall be uh, shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. And I will beat down his foes before his face and plague them that hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set his hand also in the sea, and his right hand in the river, and he shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. I also I will make him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed also will I make to endure forever, in his throne as the days of heaven. And if his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. Questions or comments? You know what, those last few verses right there are so important because um, he's reminding us that if we mess up, then there will be punishment, but he's not going to take his faithfulness away from us. Right. And I, I, I told someone the other day, I said, isn't it funny that people sometimes focus so much on the negative, they make a whole ministry out of generational curses, but n nobody talks about generational blessing. In other words, that you get so close enough that it spills over that it affects your children, your family, about those around you. Even though we've got to work out our own salvation, I think, you know, uh, what you do can affect those around you, positively or negatively. And so we have to focus on living our life for God because, you know, there's so much depends on that. All this you've got, all this you've got right now with the anti-Israel uh, in the schools, all those students, they say, and I believe that the teachers are teaching them that and making them that way, but... I believe if the kids are taught right, they don't go to college till 18 or so. That's 18 years you've got them to teach them right. I believe if they're taught right, they can't teach them wrong there. So I believe a lot of it is because the kids never was taught right. I, I, I do too, but I see a lot of kids who do 180 or change. Uh, from what they've been taught because of the environment of their schooling system. You know, what the world, they like the world, how the world is. Yeah. 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 Ones that were drugged to church maybe and had a, a bit of... Or they, they've just come under the wrong influence. The Bible said, if you walk with the wise, you'll be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. And let me say it like this. One of the most dangerous attitudes people have is when they use scripture out of context to try to justify uh, a wrong behavior and I've had people literally come at me over Facebook over the last little bit and say well Israel you know is in rebellion they've denied the Messiah so why should we back them and I said uh, are you saved you know and they said well yeah and I'm like have you always been saved yeah. well no you know, I've not. Well, why didn't God cut you off when you wouldn't maybe doing exactly what you should be doing? You know, God had mercy upon you. God has mercy upon his people. And I refer them to Romans 11 about how when God grafts Israel back in. 
And, and I, I try to tell them, you can't take the fact that simply because you don't understand the conflict or don't agree with what's going on that you, you know, throw Israel out with the bathwater. You have to understand the bigger purpose of this. And it just really shocks me of how that some people will try to use, you know, a scripture and say, well, they're not God's chosen people anymore. And some, they use what they call replacement theology and they think the church has replaced Israel, and that's not happened. The Bible said, has God cast off his people? God forbid. Read the whole book, no, they take little bits and pieces. And I've seen people, you know, who try to justify one lady one time, you know, was drinking, and she said, well, the Bible said it's not what goes into a man that defiles a man, it's what comes out, you know. And it's hypocritical, but it's the devil that's convinced them to but use things out of context. I know. But, you know, we talk talking about the most important part to me is that we should never speak negative about their church or what goes on in the church or around their children to say anything negative to them because I want them to be saved. I want my son to be saved. I want my grandchildren to be saved. Whatever I do with them, I want to be that life that we should be and show them that we're Christ-like. Not nothing in me, but what he's done for us and what he can do for them and what Christ means for us. You know, if we don't speak negative and and just uh, speak positive about God, I, you know, just like being here, this seat right here is important to me to feel because it's what I do for God. And I want, I want them... It's not nothing much, but I want them saved. And I don't want to go around and spread anything that is not of God to them. I want them to have a good picture that God is good. Uh, and it's all in us, you know. It reminds me, I think I mentioned it here one Sunday morning, but I had a little cartoon that I have cut out, and I have it in my files somewhere there at the house. And it's this little boy and this little girl, and they got their church clothes on, but it's, you know, droopy clothes because it's like mom and dad stuff. And they said, we're playing church. Yeah. And, you know, through the context of the cartoon, they got done. And they said, oh, yeah, one more thing. When we go outside, we got to talk about the preacher. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, to fulfill their idea of church, that's what they were used to seeing. And, and it happens. But sometimes, too, um, I think that we forget of, you know, bragging on the Lord and um, bragging on, you know, uh, how good God is. Because if we lift him up, and a lot of time we complain, you know, we complain about things, man, it's tough, yeah. and it's hard, and I'm struggling, and, and I understand that to a certain extent, but uh, a lot of people, you know, that's the one negative thing about social media, they get on social media and they want to rant and rave, and you've got a whole world that's looking at that, right. you know, what kind of light are we uh, projecting when we do that if, you know, we talk about folks? Or we present the gospel in, you know, a negative light. And I was telling some of you before service that um, I did a devotion the other day, and we'll close in just a minute, um, about the lug nuts on my car. And I was driving in one day, and I was thinking about, you know, driving, you know, and we get focused on where we're going and how fast we're going, and we don't think about those little things that hold it all together. And I thought, how many times do we focus on all the big battles and the big things we're trying to do. We forget about the simple fact that God woke us up and God give us mercy and God's forgave us. And and I think about people I went to school with, many of them are dead and gone, and I'm still here. And there's so much that God has done that we just let slide right on by us. And sometimes we just need a daily reminder of that. You know, we're talking about sin when we say that the little foxes is the destroy the vine. I mean, the little things. So you know, it's not not big things that you catch, but the little things that just keep go going on that you don't attend to. But we need to be we need to be yeah we need to be word that if our brother is in need whatever that we could give them good godly advice mm -hmm. and be a good light to them and a help to them if they if they need us we need to lift each other up. If you have people that come into church and they can tell, there's people with discernment that can say, what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> and there's a whole whole message there. A lot of times, and, and that's true, 
But sometimes the devil works through that. A lot of times people use discernment as an excuse for their not liking people or not liking things. And I've seen it go, you know, to the extreme to the other side. You know, I've had people, I never will forget a little lady one time before I was even married. She called me and she's just bawling and crying and why do you hate me? And I'm like, hate you? What do you mean hate you? You never shook my hand. And, you know, somehow I missed her a couple of Sundays in a row. And... You know, and she just, you know, fed on that and fed on that and fed on that. And she had convinced, and there was no problem. There was no issue. Uh, it's just sometimes, you know, things happen. And at our very best, we, we come up short. Um, and so I, I've seen people say, well, you know, the Lord showed me, you know, this was going on and that was going on. And sometimes we just, we read it wrong. And the devil likes to do that, you know. I remember one time I was in Abington. There was a little church on the back streets. Uh, I think it was called Outreach for Christ. And it was many years ago. And I went in and preached on Hezekiah. And a little lady jumped up and said, That was from God. I said, God's going to heal our pastor and he's going to give him 15 more years. I didn't say that. I just preached what the Bible said about Hezekiah. And they were going, Woo, we heard from God tonight. God's going to heal us. You know? And you've got to be careful. Sometimes people will put words in your mouth. Things that you didn't say, you know. I know me and this brother was talking. Me and used to come and pick up milk 